Hi, I'm Jonathan Oxer, and this is Superhouse. So why am I sitting here in the lounge room? Well, that's because in the cupboard right here is probably my most hated piece of technology in the house. But we'll get back to that in a second. Quite a while ago, I did an episode where I talked about using wires, not Wi-Fi, for home automation. And I copped a lot of flack for it. I had a whole lot of people say, it's crazy to be hardwiring everything, just use Wi-Fi, it's so much easier. And I had a lot of people say that, well, they got the impression that I don't like Wi-Fi at all and I don't use it. That's not true. The actual point of that video was to use the appropriate solution based on the problem that you're trying to solve. If you're doing retrofit into an older house, then maybe you have to use Wi-Fi a lot more extensively than I did because we were doing a big renovation we had stripped all the plaster off the wall, so it was a good opportunity to run more cable. But if you can't do that, Wi-Fi might be the only solution. And for non-critical devices like sensors, like temperature sensors, for example, Wi-Fi can be really good as well. But most people do Wi-Fi the wrong way. And so what I'm going to do today is show you a little bit about how to set up a Wi-Fi network for home automation in a way that will be reasonably secure and robust, much more than the typical domestic Wi-Fi setup that you normally use. So that hated piece of equipment sitting in here, it's this thing. It's a domestic Wi-Fi modem, um, router, firewall, combined, do everything in one device. These things are horrible. They're really unreliable. Typically they're given to you by your ISP as part of your package but you can do a whole lot better than this. So why are these integrated access point um, firewall routers so bad? It's because they are designed with two totally conflicting design requirements. The first is to make them as cheap as possible because they are typically given away with ISP's um, plans or you pay a minimal amount for them. And secondly, they put as many features in them as possible. That's because they want to have as many ticks on the spec sheet as they can so if you look at two different models and you say this one's got more ticks it must be better and that's what you buy but um, that means that it's terrible at everything because it's been built down to a budget and then every feature possible has been crammed in so if you look at one of these you know typical uh, domestic access points they are some kind of a modem or a network termination unit to connect to your ISP but they're also a router a firewall a wireless access point, they've often got an ethernet switch built into them, they've got a DHCP server, they do DNS resolution, um, they can do file sharing if you plug a disk into them, like a USB disk, media streaming, there will be a, like a VPN server, um, and a whole lot of other things. Now on a, a well-run network or a typical corporate network, each of those things is provided by a separate device. You don't have one thing that does your entire network. There are dedicated devices to do things like file sharing and to be a firewall or to be a wireless access point. Each of those is an important job, so you don't jam it all into one box. We, a lot of people, um, when they move beyond a basic access point, will go out and buy a wireless access point that looks like it was designed to be a stealth bomber with 17 antennas stuck on it, you know the ones I mean. And that's a, certainly a step up from you know the budget thing that your ISP will give you but I'm going to show you how to set up a network uh, for your home system that is a little bit more similar to a small corporate network where you have dedicated devices that are really good at doing a specific job and a management system that lets you keep control over the devices in your network. If you're like most people, you'll have a home network that looks something like this. You'll have a connection coming in from your ISP, which will be ADSL or cable or whatever, and it plugs into a do-everything box that's a Wi-Fi router and firewall and, you know, pretty much everything. Then you've got some things hardwired to it, maybe a printer, maybe a TV, game console, that just plugs into the switch on the back of the router. And then you'll have a bunch of different devices connecting by Wi-Fi. What this architecture does is put all of the load on that Wi-Fi router. It has to do everything. We can improve that a lot. First thing we can do is remove the reliance on the router for Wi-Fi and everything else and change it from being a router into a bridge. 
With a bridge, what it does is take whatever technology your ISP is using and just provide you with an Ethernet connection on the other side. It doesn't act as an access point, doesn't provide any firewalling or routing. It just links the two different media types together. So you'll often see this referred to as an NTU or a network termination unit as well. The important thing is that it just gives you Ethernet as a connection to the internet and it doesn't try to do any fancy stuff itself. Then what we do is we add our own firewall router that connects into that and this acts as the protection for the internal network and it provides any routing that we need. Because firewall routers don't typically have built-in Ethernet switches, we then plug it into an external Ethernet switch as well. This allows us to have as many Ethernet ports as we want depending on the size of your network. In my case, I've got quite a few rack mount Ethernet switches in two racks in different parts of the house. Then devices like your printers and game consoles, etc. can connect to your Ethernet switch and they get full YSB connection right through to your router. No bottlenecks at all. But we also need to provide Wi-Fi access for all of those other devices. So what we'll do is install a couple of Wi-Fi access points or however many you need to effectively cover the area of your house. These don't need to do anything like routing, they're just wireless access points. They handle the connection to all the different devices, and then they pass that down the cable connection through the Ethernet to the firewall router. Now this is all starting to look quite complicated, there are a lot of different devices here. If you're used to logging into the management interface on your wireless access point and making changes in that, like changing your Wi-Fi password and adding users and all of those sorts of things. We need some way to do that. And it's a pain to have to log into each device individually to manage it. So what we are also going to do is put in a management system. In my case, I'm going to install this on a Raspberry Pi and it will provide a user interface that I can use to control the different devices around the network, look at network statistics and see what's going on. Now you can build up a system like this just from odds and ends of different parts. In this case though, what I'm going to do is use the Unify family of systems from Ubiquiti. That means I'm going to run a Unify security gateway as my firewall router. I'll run the Unify controller software on the Raspberry Pi, and I'm going to run Unify access points. I could also run Unify ethernet switches, but they're pretty expensive and I've already got a bunch of rack mount ethernet switches, so I'm going to leave the existing ones in place. If you haven't worked with commercial level networking equipment, you probably haven't heard of the brand Ubiquiti Networks. That's because they don't really deal at the consumer level. This is the sort of gear that you put in if you want to build a Wi-Fi network across an entire city. Or say you wanted to fit out a multi-story hotel, you need to put in 50 wireless access points and be able to manage them all from a centralized console. Or if you've got multiple branch offices for a company and you want to be able to control access at all of the different offices from one system. That might sound crazy using like high-end commercial gear in a domestic situation, but they make a range called Unify, which is actually pretty decently priced, and it has some really nice features that make it good for a high-end domestic setup, particularly what you'd want for home automation. Now, one thing that confuses a lot of people is the difference between Ubiquiti Networks and Unify. So Ubiquiti Networks is the name of the company that makes this gear. Unify is a product family within their range. It's um, a group of products that work well together and that can all talk to the same management console. So what you can do is uh, pick different parts out of the Unify range and deploy them and know that you can control it all uh, from the same management system. So I've got a Unify security gateway here which I'm going to use as my firewall router and I've also got a couple of APAC Pro access points. So these are what are going to give the Wi-Fi access to my whole house. Now you've probably walked past hundreds of these things and never even realized it. If you've been into a hotel or any kind of a public establishment like a pub or you know a shopping center, these things are typically scattered around, mounted up on the ceiling, looking like little UFOs. And you probably walked past many of them. You probably even accessed the internet through them and not even realized it. So far, this all just sounds like a big infomercial for Ubiquiti, but you can achieve most of what I'm going to show you here with a more DIY solution. This is a mini ITX motherboard specifically designed for building routers. You can see it's got four Ethernet ports on there. It's got a quad-core processor in it. All you do is uh, add some memory and a little um, solid-state drive. This is um, stuff I got off AliExpress pretty cheaply. It's called a J1900 
Mini ITX motherboard. I'll put a link to this in the video description as well. This is actually the sort of thing that I've generally used in the past for building firewall routers, usually using either PFSense or OpenSense. In fact, my current network uses this particular board, or well, another one identical to this, running OpenSense as my gateway. Instead of using the ubiquity parts that I'll show you in this video, you can build a similar network by substituting a few parts. Remove the management controller from the system and replace the Unify security gateway with a DIY firewall router using PFSense or OPNSense. Instead of using ubiquity Unify access points, use regular access points with all their extra features turned off. In fact, this diagram is structurally the same as my network right now, except that I have more access points and Ethernet switches. It works pretty well, but I'm missing out on a couple of things that I really want. By replacing some of the devices of my current network with ubiquity devices, I'll get the benefit of a network management controller. But the really big benefit is that I'll get seamless handover between access points as devices move from one location to another, and they can get picked up by the different access point. That's because Unify access points coordinate with each other to provide the best connection for all devices, and your devices can switch between access points so smoothly that you can't even tell it's happening. Instead of just ripping everything out and starting again, I'm going to convert my network in four distinct steps. That way it'll minimize impact and it's not going to leave me with a day of downtime while I mess around with everything. First, I'm going to install the management controller. That's the software that will be used to configure everything else and provide a nice management interface. You can do that without making any other change to your network and experiment with it. Second, I'm going to swap out my firewall. I'll replace the DIY router I've got at the moment running OpenSense with the Unify Security Gateway. Third, I'm going to swap out the Wi-Fi access points, replace the existing Apple and D-Link and whatever else I've got access points with the Unify APs. And fourth, I'm going to make some configuration changes to the network because by that point I'll have a system that is fully functional. It'll essentially be doing the same thing as I had previously. But then we can make some changes that will make things better for IoT devices, give us more compartmentalization, insight into what's going on on the network, and make sure that if there are any pesky devices that cause problems, they're not going to mess everything else up. The first thing we'll do before making any other changes to the network is to install the Unify controller software. There are three different ways you can do this. The first thing is you can download it and run it on your own computer. It runs on Mac, Linux, and Windows, so you can just install it, run it, and experiment with it. In fact, that's really all you need to do, because what you can do is use it for setting up the devices on your network and then quit it afterwards. But ideally, you need to keep it running all the time. That way, you've got a nice convenient dashboard you can log into, and it can do things like collect statistics for you. So the second option is to buy a Unify Cloud Key. This is basically a little embedded computer with the controller software pre-installed on it. All you do is plug it into your network and power it up, and then you've got a local management system that you can use to control your network and it doesn't rely on any other computers running. You just log into it with a web browser and you can see it whenever you want to. But I'd prefer to take a bit more of a DIY approach. So I'm going to use this Raspberry Pi. You can install the controller software directly on a Raspberry Pi. So let's do that instead. Um, this Raspberry Pi is nothing special, it's just a Raspberry Pi 3B+. It happens to have this hat on it which um, was designed by uh, a friend of mine, Nick Fryer, and it's got a switch mode voltage regulator on it. That's just so that I can plug 12 volts in here and it will power up. But you could just as easily power it off the USB port if you wanted to. One important thing to note is that I've got it plugged into um, cabled Ethernet here because you really don't want your management system to be connecting by Wi-Fi onto the Wi-Fi system that it's managing because if anything goes wrong, you're screwed. What we're going to do is start off with a base Raspbian install and then install the Unify controller software onto this. The Raspberry Pi is now connected to my wired Ethernet network and it's running a totally default Raspbian install. The only change I've made is I created a file in the slash boot directory called SSH. That's just so that I can SSH into it here. So let's log in and have a look. I've got to log in as the Pi user and um, then the default password is raspberry and it complains here that we haven't changed the default password. We'll do that in just a second. But the first thing we're going to do is set a static IP address. So 
do a um, well edit etc dhcpcd.conf and just go right down near the bottom and then you can add a block in here we're going to set interface eth0 because we want to set the first um, hardwired ethernet interface and we'll set the IP address to 192.168.1.2 and this is on a slash 24 network now that particular IP address is I'm picking specifically for my network my current network uses 192.168.1. whatever and the um, the unifier security gateway by default sets us up, for up as 192.168.1.1 which means that everything else is going to be in that same subnet so I'm going to make this the dot two device and then we need to tell it the um, location of the router so we'll do routers equals 192.168.1.1 as I just said and we'll also tell it for now that the domain name server is going to be the router so we'll say static domain name servers equals 168.1.1 and then all we do is control x yes to write that out so if this now reboots it should come up on that static IP address but before we reboot it what we'll do is also do a raspy config and this will let us change a couple of things firstly we'll change the user password so put in what you want as your new password and then we're going to change something in the network config we'll change the host name and it's just Raspberry Pi by default but I want to make it um, controller because every time you set up a new Raspbian machine it comes up with Raspberry Pi as the host name we need something that's going to be a little bit more unique so I'm just going to call this one controller and then that should be it finish would you like to reboot yes so the Raspberry Pi is now rebooting it'll come back up on 192.168.1.2 as its IP address the password will have been changed and the host name is now set to controller so even though we haven't actually installed anything it's now ready for the Unify controller software to go on I'll try logging back in now it's going to be pi at controller.local yes and the password is now the new one that I've set and I'm logged in so we're now on the machine ready to begin our installation and just as a test we do if config we can see the IP address up here is 192.168.1.2 and if we do route minus n we can see in the routing table we've got 192.168.1.1 as our gateway now personally I think video is a horrible way to show command line stuff but don't worry I'm going to put all of these instructions on the Superhouse site so if you follow the link in the YouTube description it'll take you to the page with all of this in it you can just copy and paste it much quicker and easier but we're almost there the only thing we've got to do now is the specific stuff for installing Unify so the first thing we're going to do is install um, Havagay D the daemon Havagay D uh, this is a thing that generates entropy which you can think of as being like randomness it's used for the um, cryptography inside Unify so um, it just makes startup faster it doesn't have to wait for randomness to occur the other problem is that we need to install a different version of Java uh, OpenJDK um, R8 uh, the Java runtime environment because the version of Java that is normally installed with Raspbian really doesn't work very well with Unify uh, so if we install this version it'll work just fine okay so Java is installed and now what we're going to do is update the list of uh, package repositories so this entry here is going to be installed into um, a file uh, so that when we do we can do a, an apt install on the package this is the repository that's maintained by Ubiquity Networks and that's where they provide the, um, the packages that they make for Unify specifically so you can install it and what we're also going to do is add the GPG key so um, what we'll do is 
wget the um, the gpg key coming from um, ubiquity networks once again and we're going to install it okay we grab that and now just do an update because we've got a new uh, source of packages we need to pull down a refresh list and now it's just apt install unify and this will pull down both unify and a bunch of dependencies you'll see that it's pulling down uh, mongodb which it uses for storing statistics and other things and some other packages that it needs to do its job it doesn't take very long and we're done so now we've got the unify software installed on the raspberry pi which is still sitting on my bench i'll mount that permanently later but we can already log into it just with a web browser and start having a look at what's in there so now all we do is use a web browser and load it up and I'm going to force it to go into um, HTTPS so that it's using SSL and the IP address we set for it was 192.168.1.2 and on port 8443 so you need to go to that address hit enter and then we will get a warning because um, we don't have the SSL certificate set up but now we can go through the setup wizard I'm going to change my location. I'm not in the US, I'm in Australia. So I'll find that up in the list. It's figured out that I'm at UTC plus 11. And I'll enable, leave auto backup enabled. Next. It hasn't found any devices. And that's because so far all we've got is the manager. We don't actually have any of the other unified devices set up on the network. But it'll be able to discover them once we set them up. So we'll just say next and configure Wi-Fi. Skip this if you're not setting up any access points. Right now we're not. So we will skip. Now we just need to set up details. Now it says admin name but it'll complain if you do something like this. So you have to just put in, it's like a username I suppose, admin email, I'll put in my email address and password. Make sure you set a strong password here. Now I use randomly generated uh, character strings. So I've just pasted that in and I'll manage that in a password manager. Uh, automatically optimize my network, we can leave that on. And finish. We don't have SSID or anything else set up, but we will add that when we get to it. Now if you want to set up cloud-based access, you do that by signing up on the ubnt.com system but I'm not going to, I'm just going to skip that and I'm going to manage my own remote access. Now it starts off by giving you this big spiel about all the things it can do, let's get rid of that and we've now got the, uh, the basic control panel so this is where you can go about setting up all the details of your particular network installation and get statistics and things but none of this is going to show anything useful. The important thing though was just to get this set up as a starting point so that now we can plug in the various other devices and they will become visible in this control panel. But before you just pull out your old firewall, make sure you get a record of any DHCP leases that you've got set up. If you have devices that you want to make sure they always come up on the same IP address, it's pretty common to have a DHCP lease set so that it matches the MAC address of the device and then gives it the same IP address each time. In my case, I'm using OpenSense at the moment on my current firewall so what I can do is go into services DHCP v4 and in here it's got the lease range that's been configured and down here I've got a list of the, uh, the static leases. So what I'm going to do is just grab a copy of all of that, very simple, very low tech, grab a, um, a text document, paste it in and save it. And that way when I come to setting up the Unify Security Gateway if I want to create leases, I've got a record of the MAC address and the IP addresses that I set last time. Then I can make sure that the network is going to work in the future the same as it has been up until now. Because I've already switched my modem router over into bridging mode, this is going to be a very easy process. If you're still using your router as it came from the factory, you may need to switch it into bridging mode so that you've got Ethernet output. I'm not going to replace this. I'm going to leave it in place, but just use its Ethernet connection uh, to go into the new Unify Security Gateway. I'd already done that, which is why I've got this little box down here, this board, which is running OpenSense. So the first thing I'm going to do is shut that down. 
and then we can pop the new Unify security gateway in its place. So the security gateway has a number of ports on it. There's console, which is used for a serial connection if you want to do a config that way. It's got a WAN connection, WAN 1, which is wide area network that goes to your internet connection. And it has LAN 1, which is to your internal network. There's also another port that you can use for uh, various purposes. You can set it up to be a second internet connection if you want a failover type system, or you can set it up to be a second internal network. I'm going to plug WAN 1 into the grey internet connection and LAN 1 into the blue ethernet connection. And I need to put in the power supply. Now with power connected to the security gateway, you can see that it's blinking white. That means that it hasn't yet been adopted by a controller. It's just sitting there ready to be configured. Right now the controller software doesn't know anything about that gateway, but we can get it to adopt it. So you just go down to devices and it's uh, had a look around the network and it's discovered that we have this gateway. It says pending adoption. And uh, so all you need to do is select it. Say adopt and upgrade and confirm. So what this is going to do is set up a secure communications link between the controller software and the gateway. The gateway itself doesn't have its own user interface. We do everything through this controller software. It's also going to do a firmware update to it. If your security gateway needs a firmware update as part of this adoption process, this can take a while because it needs to pull down the firmware and then apply the update. Just let it go and do its thing. Come back in a little while. After a couple of minutes, the status has gone to connected. So we now have a fully managed security gateway. If we go back to the dashboard, oh, and just before we do, over on the right, you can see the status of the three physical ports. You can see that it's connected at one gigabit per second on both the WAN port and the LAN port. And I didn't plug the third port in. Now we can close this little status panel, go back to the dashboard, and we'll start to see some statistics come in. We don't have the access points installed yet, so we've got no Wi-Fi metrics, but everything else is looking good. Now, if you just leave this running for a little bit, you'll start to see some statistics appear in here. This scale is across 24 hours, so it'll take a while, but you'll begin to see a little chart appear. But remember earlier that I said I needed to set static IP addresses on some devices on my network. We can do that through here as well. If you come down to the client section, you'll see a list of all the devices that the security gateway has discovered. Now there are two ways to add a static IP address into this list. If it's one that hasn't been seen before, we can go into add client. And what I need to do is have a look at the MAC address. Over here I've got, for example, the West switchboard controller. I'm going to copy that MAC address and paste it into here. And I'm going to give it an alias and I'll call it West switchboard. That way, when the, uh, when the list is generated, it'll show the name of where switchboard and we'll know what it is. Now for the network, I'm just gonna set it on the LAN and for the IP address, I need to paste in the IP address that I had in my little list. So I'll stick that in there, hit add and submit. And we now have an entry for that device. So if that device comes up with that MAC address and says, hey, give me an IP address, it'll be given the dot 33 address that we just configured. However, if we try to do that for a device that the security gateway already knows about, it won't work if it's appeared in the list. We have to do that another way. For example, look at this entry here, the one that's dot 74, that is for my iMac, which is actually what I'm recording on right now. So if I click on that, we can see the little details window appear over here. It says it's an Apple device, it's got dot 74, and we can make some changes here to set that statically. Let's go into configuration. We'll give it an I alias and we'll just call it John's iMac. Now this is just, oops, iMoc. This is just a human readable label that has no meaning whatsoever in terms of the network. It just changes how it appears in the list. So I'll save that, come down to network and I'll say use fixed IP address. It's already populated this because it knows the address that is currently set for that device. It's on the list. Well, oh look, it's updated. The list now says John's iMac down there, and that's the IP it's been assigned. So I could change it to something else, but I'm just gonna leave it as that and hit save. It's been saved successfully, that's nice. So now on the list, John's iMac is listed instead of just the MAC address. If you hover over it, you can still see the MAC. 
and it's been set a static IP of .74. Any time that device comes up on the network now, that's what it's going to get. So you can just repeat that process for any of the devices that you want to have statically assigned IPs on your network. Now before you go any further with setting up hardware, one of the really cool things that you can do with the controller software is use it to plan how your hardware is going to be set up. You can do this just by downloading the controller software and running it on your local machine. You don't need to actually buy any Ubiquiti hardware to do this. Just get it up and running and then use these features within the GUI. If you come over here to the map section, what this does is show you an example of a physical layout. And uh, this is an example from an office, but what we can do is set up a house. And it supports multiple maps. So there's the sample map. All we need to do is come over here and say, add new map. And you can either pick from a Google map based on your location or an image and map name. So I'm just going to call this home, nice and simple, and choose a map image. On my computer, I've got a floor plan of the, um, the layout of my house as a JPEG. So I'll just select that. Um, we did renovations a few years ago. This is a slightly outdated plan. Uh, if you don't have a plan for your house, don't worry. You can um, use the GUI, as you'll see in just a second, to kind of create one. Or you can go to some service like floorplanner.com and draw up the layout of your house. And here you can see that it's just loaded up the floor plan. And I'll hit Save. And it's now loading that plan. So I'll zoom back out to get it all to fit. And one of the first things that we need to do is set the scale. And uh, it's got a built-in feature for that. So just down here you can see it says set map scale. And if you know the physical dimensions of part of your plan, you can use this to say this particular thing is this long. So what we're going to do is click on set map scale and draw a line by clicking and dragging. So I'm going to draw a line from this point here to this point here. And I happen to know that the distance between those two walls physically is 5.32 meters. So I'll just set that, say set scale, and now the software knows the dimensions of the building. And we can now use this to place objects in here, such as access points. But it also needs to take into account things like the structure of the wall so that it can calculate if you put this behind two walls is it going to reduce the signal strength and we can go through now and use the image that we've imported as something like a template and then draw the lines on it specifying the material that is used so if we go down to the add wall section in here you can see it's got options for a drywall which is a 3db to 4db drop-in signal cubicle material wood, brick, concrete, all these different materials. So what I'm going to do is say, uh, oh, and you've got options, you can change the thickness and things as well. I'm just going to leave this default and say drywall. And I'm going to draw a line down this point right here. So what I'll do now is just go through and add all the walls and all the windows and um, You'll see what happens when it's finished. After about half an hour of stuffing around, I've got the map pretty well sorted. What I've done is gone through and put um, drywall where there are places for internal walls. I put timber where there are doors, glass here. I've got timber where there are external walls because we've got weatherboard on most of it. So it's a reasonable representation of the house. And now what you can do is come along into here and go place devices and select virtual devices. And this shows devices that you don't necessarily have. This is the Unify range. Now if I go for Unify APAC Pro, I'll grab that. Oops, grab the little drag thing. Drag one out here. Drag another one in here because I'm planning to put two in place. Click in there to make the list go away. And I'll probably put one in the garage up around here somewhere. This is the bedroom end of the house. And then another one around here in the lounge room which will cover the lounge room and kitchen area of the house. Now this is where things get interesting. If we come up to layers we can turn on coverage and we can select either 2G or 5G coverage. And what you can see here is the, an estimate of the signal strength based on the location of the access point and the obstructions around it. 
So for example, just in here, if we zoom in on this little area and have a look at, um, at what's going on here, if we have this access point in the garage here, it's got a couple of layers of wall and you can see that the signal is being attenuated in these bedrooms, but the coverage extends further on this side because there are no walls or barriers in the way. And down in here, which is where my little office lab is, my computer is set up in this corner right here, the signal strength is starting to get quite weak. Well, this is all relative. The, um, it looks like by the time you get through a wall or so, you wouldn't have any coverage, but the reality is that the coverage on these things is pretty good. What it does give you, though, is a really nice way of moving these around and just getting an idea of, hey, if I put this all the way down in this end of the house because there's a cupboard there and it's convenient, maybe that won't give me very good coverage through the middle of the house. So you can just move these around and think about where you're going to put them. In my case, I think I'm going to put one right here. This is where the cupboard is, where the, uh, the firewall is, where I was just showing you. So I'll probably mount that up in the top cupboard so it'll be up at ceiling height. This one I think I'll just put on the ceiling of the garage somewhere around here. I think I might move it back a little bit towards the door. That'll improve coverage through the office area and still give reasonable coverage through these bedrooms. So that's a really useful little tool. Now obviously that's not a substitute for actually going out on site and doing a site survey measuring signal strength because there are so many variables. There are different materials and things that will influence the, um, the signal and how it's attenuated as it travels through a building. But you know, half an hour fiddling around with this, setting up the map and then dragging objects out onto it, and you can get a pretty good idea of uh, optimal places to put access points and things within your house. Before I install these access points, I've got them all wired up here on the bench so you can see how they're connected. I've got the little Raspberry Pi over here, which is running the, um, the controller software. I've got that loaded up in the browser and everything is connected. I've got the power over Ethernet injectors, I've got an Ethernet switch and I've got two access points. So we'll get all the connections set up here, get it bound to the controller software so that it's got control of them and then we'll decide physically where they're going to be mounted. This Ethernet switch is currently connected out to my network so this would be your internal LAN. And then each of these access points is powered over one of, using one of these power over Ethernet injectors. The connection coming out of this Ethernet switch is just regular Ethernet. And by putting this in series with it, power can then be sent down the network cable. There's no particular significance to the blue and red here. I just did this to show the difference. The red cable is the powered cable, blue is the unpowered cable. These particular access points don't have any way to power them directly they have to take power over the Ethernet connection. So I've set them up here to power them up, connect them to the network in order to make them discoverable, and then we can adopt them using the uh, controller software. Now, if you have an Ethernet switch which supports power over Ethernet natively, you don't need this injector. The cable can just be plugged straight into the Ethernet switch. Now, once this is all installed, of course, these injectors will sit next to the Ethernet switch this cable itself will actually be long. That will travel through the building to wherever the uh, access point has been installed. With the access points powered up now, sitting on the bench, connected to the network, we can do the discovery, bind them to the controller software. So come down to the devices list here, and you can see that we have the gateway connected, and we also have the two access points. It says pending adoption and update required. That just means that it's discovered that the software version is out of date. So what we can do is just click on one of those and click adopt and upgrade and confirm. So that's going to take a little while and I'll click on the second one. I can just do it right from here. Adopt and upgrade, confirm. So both those access points are now being bound to the controller software and it's applying the firmware updates to both of them. This might take a little while once again if it's got to pull down that firmware. So just let it do its thing. Once the provisioning has been completed and the firmware update has been applied, you'll see they just get listed here as connected. And that means that we can now start to manage those access points. You can see details of them over here on the right, and you can change different settings, and you can do things like scan the, uh, the RF environment to see what channels are being used. But this is one of the areas where using this sort of centrally managed system is different to a normal domestic network. 
in a typical system, what you would do is log into your access point and define what you want as your SSID, which is your network name and password and all of those things. But if you're building a system where you have multiple access points, or if you've got an office where, or a large installation where you might have dozens or hundreds of access points, that's not practical. So what you do is simply define networks for the site, and then that just propagates to the actual access points. So what we're going to do, instead of configuring directly in here, is go down to the bottom into settings, and in here I've already set a site name. This is just a human readable label. This is for the superhouse, and I've set my um, address here. And one thing I'm going to do is turn on automatically upgrade access point firmware. I'll just make that go away over there. And that way, when there are new updates available, they'll get them automatically. And then go into wireless networks. So there are no wireless networks that have been configured. We're just going to go create new wireless network. And we'll set the SSID. And I'm just going to set this one to Superhouse. And I'm going to enable WPA personal authentication. And I'm going to set the password. And this is one area where there are some really interesting options, but we're going to get back to that. For now, what we're going to do is just set up a wireless network that behaves pretty much the way you would expect it to behave. So it's got a publicly visible SSID, it's got one password that applies to the whole network, and it'll work just as you would on a normal domestic Wi-Fi network, but with multiple access points that are coordinated. So now we're just going to hit save on that. And we've now got the, um, the wireless network defined here. And if we go back to devices and click on this and WLANs, we can see that it's now inherited the Superhouse network and it's now advertising that network. So this access point could now be used and different devices can now connect to them and be part of my network. So we've just provisioned those two access points through this um, central system. Now I need to actually physically put them in place. Installing the access points is pretty easy. The only thing is because I live in Australia and it's illegal for me to tie my own shoelaces without doing a four year bootmaker apprentice, I had to get a cabler to install Cat6 cable and terminate it inside the ceiling. That way I could just plug in a patch lead, poke it down through a hole in the ceiling and no laws broken. All you need to do is screw the bracket up on there, onto the connector on here where it says main. You plug in the network connection. It'll power up and then you just twiddle it, give it a click and it's in place. Now I'm cutting this episode short because there's still a whole lot more to get through and I don't want to make this too long. And at this point you've got a network that'll be functional. So you've got um, multiple uh, access points and You've got centralized control over a whole lot of things. But the really interesting stuff is going to come later when we talk about authentication and VLANs and how to keep your IoT devices isolated from other things. So, and SSL certificates, so that your um, controller doesn't give you that message every time you log into it. So, I'm going to follow this up pretty much right away with another episode all about the configuration and the cool things you can do once you've got the basic hardware and infrastructure in place. In the meantime, go and build something cool.